Please be sure to keep the Crockett family in your prayers uh, this morning and, and during this week. Uh, for those of you that are not aware, uh, Ralph Crockett uh, passed away yesterday. Um, he uh, uh, had a, just some uh, health complications from surgeries that he had, and he passed away uh, yesterday. So do keep Sam, Brenda, the rest of the family in your prayers. Uh, they'll be having a small uh, family um, graveside for him um, up, up in uh, where they're living now. So just keep the family in your prayer during this time. Uh, you officially have 25 shopping days until Christmas. If you're not aware of that, there you go. That's your public service announcement for the day. But don't worry, you have plenty of time. Um, we also have the added benefit, and for those of you that, especially during the, the pandemic, have taken uh, probably some advantage of this, that we can actually shop now any day, time, any time of day, day or night, doesn't really matter. We just wait for the packages to arrive in the mail. I was looking at statistics about this. According to the Washington Post, this is astounding to me, the UPS will ship somewhere around 750 million packages this holiday season. Ryan's thankful that he's in freight and not small packaging during this season of the year. 750 million, that's just a crazy amount of packages. If you have family or friends that maybe you're, you're looking for the perfect gift for them, I have a couple of options uh, for those of you especially that like to get things in the mail. Um, have you guys ever tried the gift of the month clubs or those, those monthly clubs? I've tried them for fishing. But a lot of the lures and things, they just don't work for me. I don't know. Uh, but for about $50 a month, you can sign up for one of these gift of the month that uh, uh, the, the, they mail you these things. I found one uh, that was called the Bacon of the Month Club. I was like, really? Bacon of the Month? Interesting. For, for the recipient, if you sign up for this, will receive two one-pound selections of artisan bacon every month. Just in the mail. There you go. Just bacon in the mail. There's also some of the odder ones I found. I don't know. There's a Pickle of the Month Club. I don't know why anybody would want or any pickle connoisseurs out there, but a pickle of the month club, even a PB and J of the month club. I don't even know how that would work. I don't even. I'm not going there. But I mean, I just think of children anticipating the arrival of their peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the mail. I, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. Uh, back in 2003, there's a story uh, told. CNN ran a story on this. There was a man who actually attempted to ship himself home from New York to Dallas in a crate. Um, he had packaged himself in a crate. Somehow he actually made it. I don't even know how that would work, but somehow he actually made it home. Unfortunately for him, in the final delivery, uh, the delivery man saw through the cracks that there was a, a person in the crate and called the police. And unfortunately, this guy had outstanding warrants, so he was arrested. So it was kind of an, an easy arrest there. Anyway, Christmas is a time of, of waiting. It's a time of expectation. As we wait and prepare ourselves, it actually, I thought about thinking about the idea of preparation. And really most of our life is spent in some sort of waiting and preparation when only a small percentage of our life is actually the, the experience or the, the celebration or the actual doing. Most of our life is spent in the preparation. If, for those of you that just had Thanksgiving, how much time did it take to prepare the meal? I know in the house that, that we went uh, with my, with my uh, mother-in-law, it was like all day and actually some of the night before spent preparing this meal. And then how long did it take to eat it? Like 20 minutes, you know? And so when we really think about it, that's, that's really kind of how life is. We're just waiting and preparing for stuff. How many of you like camping? Any, any campers out there like camping? I don't like camping. I grew up camping. Sorry, Mom, if you're watching this online. I, I, I don't like camping anymore. I don't do it. Roughing it for me is Motel 6. That's just the way it works. Um, but if you, when you go camping, if you really think about it, what are you doing? You're preparing. You're preparing the fire. You're preparing the tents. You're preparing the meals. You're preparing. That's, that's most of what camping is about. And so when we think about it, we really shouldn't be surprised that life is really mostly about waiting and preparing. Some actually have said that preparation is the point. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. Preparation is the point. Our Christian life, what is it? It's preparation for eternity. The best use of our time here on earth is to prepare our hearts, becoming more like Jesus, to help other people get prepared to meet Jesus in heaven. The primary point of the Old Testament was preparation for one moment. Some uh, scholars have, have identified what they call the proto-evangelium. Um, it, it's really what the, the 
the, the word breaks down in two different words, a compound word. First is that protos, and then uh, evangelion is, is the good news of the gospel. And it's a word that we combine, and, and it really is the first declaration of the gospel. You can actually look it up. It's in Genesis 3.15. It's what we call the proto-evangelium. It, it, it takes place directly after Adam and Eve sinned. God actually addressing the serpent said this. He said, I will put hostility between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. The work that the serpent began, that expressed through Adam and Eve's choice to sin, would one day be crushed through the arrival of her offspring. The offspring, of course, is the one that Christmas is all about. From the moment of the first sin, the entire Old Testament prepares and points to the moment when the Savior, when the Messiah, came to save us from the curse of sin. The law and the sacrificial system, it showed us our need for a Savior. The slavery and the sorrow of the Israelites point to the bondage that we all face before we put our faith in Jesus. The prophets, they looked for and they longed for the coming of the Messiah. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Micah, was inspired by God to write this, Micah 5, 2. He said, Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. The one from ancient times that Micah wrote about more than one has more than 100 different names in the Bible. He's called the Alpha and the Omega. He's called the Word of Life. He's called the bright morning star, the light of the world. He's called the I Am, the Ancient of Days. His name is Jesus. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. And when Jesus arrived, he came humbly and quietly in a small forgotten town, Bethlehem, that didn't even have a proper room for his arrival. But this morning, we're not going to allow the circumstances that he chose to fulfill these prophecies, confuse us on who the child actually is. He's the ancient one, the creator, the author, and the giver of life. He is the word of God. And so for hundreds of years, the Israelites and the prophets, as we sung about this morning, O come, O come, Emmanuel, they looked for him and they waited for his rescue. So Advent is the time that we wait and prepare we wait for Christmas. We prepare for Christ's arrival. As the prophets waited for Jesus' arrival, we wait and prepare for his second coming. In some way, we know that Micah, Isaiah, Moses, and so many who looked for Jesus, we know what they went through. Like them, we know that Jesus is coming again, but we, we don't know when. So like them, we need to prepare our hearts to receive and grow in him now. And anticipate one day when we will meet him face to face. We don't know when he'll come. But one thing I am confident of. We are in the last days. I believe we will soon witness his arrival. So we should prepare for his coming. How do we prepare? That's the question. How do we prepare? First, preparation begins with repentance. Preparation begins with repentance. You might say that John the Baptist was the last prophet who had to wait for Jesus' first arrival. And he showed us how to prepare our hearts for Jesus in our lives. And how to prepare our hearts for his return. Look at the words of John the Baptist that were recorded in Matthew chapter 3. This is what, what John wrote. He said, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. In verse 8, John writes, therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance. Verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance. John's message was one of repentance. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I'm not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John the Baptist told us how to prepare our hearts for Christ's coming, and it's through repentance. 
Repentance in its simplest definition means to turn. And that's a very simplistic definition, I know, but it's just one that's easily remembered. Repentance is to turn. You see, John isn't calling out to people and telling them to repent, saying this, well, you better start feeling really guilty about all the things that you've done. That's not what John is saying. John is not saying, I want you to feel really bad about yourself. That's not repentance either. Repentance certainly can begin with feeling bad about something, but John is saying something completely different. He's saying, change, turn, change your approach, adjust what you're doing, reconsider how you think about things, begin to think and act differently than what you are right now. It begins with repentance. Advent gives us an opportunity to consider our approach and make a change. Is this Christmas going to be like all the rest? Well, it's 20, saying like 20, the rest of 2020, I'm going to say, no, it's not. But for many of us, Christmas still is, is rushed. It's stressful. It's overwhelming. Maybe we should take a, a cue from the prophets of old who are waiting for Jesus' arrival. Maybe we should allow this season, especially this season, to be one of reflection, one of adoration and repentance. Because there's no better footing on the road to Jesus than with a broken humility, understanding our needs and repentance. The psalmist told us this in Psalm 51, verse 17. He said, the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. Despite the vast array of Old Testament prophecies describing the birth, death, and life and purpose of the Messiah, there was one idea that caused the vast majority of religious leaders to miss the gift of the Messiah when it came. Strangely, they didn't understand the significance of original sin. We know that the regulations and the requirements and all of the religious trappings were very important to them, but they didn't understand the redemption for sin. Avoiding sin was paramount. They, they wanted that. They wanted to avoid sin. But redemption for sin was nearly ignored. When they looked for salvation, they weren't really thinking about their need for salvation from sin. They were looking for a different type of salvation. It is so tempting for us today to fall into the exact same trap. Looking for salvation from foreign rule or oppressive government. That's what they were looking for. Their mistake was in the mission of the Messiah. And that's why they missed it. And so it is so important for us not to make the same mistake. It is so tempting. Let us remember that we are in desperate need. Although our feelings might tell us otherwise, our biggest need isn't paying our bills or figuring out how to, how to pay for Christmas or whatever it might be. We're not so looking for a desperate way to get everything done that needs to be done before Christmas. We're desperate. And the world is desperate for a Savior to cleanse us from our sins once and for all. We are in need of the Messiah who came to die who came to die. Preparation begins with repentance. Preparation also increases expectation. Increases expectation. Have you ever considered how you would prepare? Maybe for work or for school, for some of you online, whatever it might be. Um, some of the preparation might be different right now. But have you ever considered how you prepare if you expected Jesus to be sitting there when you arrived? If this morning you really thought in your mind, when I come to worship this morning, God Almighty is going to show up. How would you prepare? Would you do something differently? How would you have spent your time this morning if you knew the Holy Spirit was waiting for you to tell you something amazing if you were ready to listen? If you really believed that you were living in the last days, would you do things differently? If we had such expectations, I imagine it would affect our preparation for each season, for each day. Because here's the reality. Jesus indeed will be at your work tomorrow. He will be at your school. He will be at home when you get there this afternoon. God is always ready to meet you as you reach out to meet him. 
God's word is active and and it's alive. And and God is willing to speak to you if you're ready to listen. Remember, he is called Emmanuel, God with us. And he is here now. He was here with us yesterday. And he will be with us tomorrow. And this knowledge should change how we prepare. How we prepare for our work. How we prepare for our school. How we prepare for church. How we go about our lives. Preparation begins with repentance, but preparation also should increase our expectation. Third, preparation brings fruit. Preparation brings fruit. There is one tent test, the demonstration of whether or not you really have repented. You ready? Your behavior changes. Your behavior changes. That's the, that's the test of, of whether or not really, if, if repentance has come into your life, if you've really trusted in Christ, if you've really repented of your sin, your behavior changes. See, if a person commits a sin against you and apologizes, right, but then goes out and does the exact same thing again, has the person really repented? And you would have to say, No, of course not. We're not talking about forgiveness here. Forgiveness is found in the strength of the cross, not the strength of our apologies, the strength of our will. We're talking about repentance. The person was apologized. Maybe they felt really sorry about what they did. Maybe the person didn't want to do what they did again, but the fruit shows whether a person has actually had any change of heart whatsoever. And in the same way, the fruit of our lives shows our preparation through repentance. Sometimes the change is incremental and sometimes it takes a while before it's complete. But if you're not walking away from sin, you haven't repented. If you're not turning away from sin, then you've not repented. I think about the difference between feeling sorry and and repenting is found in we really understood how ugly and how damaging sin really is. We're sorry, but the need the sin has met in our lives has has a different effect. The the draw the sin has in our life, the habit that we have built up is actually stronger than our repulsion to the sin. Have you ever wondered why people have to reach rock bottom before they actually turn around? This is why. This is why. We have to see the real impact and the ugliness of sin. Its ugliness has to be great enough for us to say, I'll do whatever it takes to never go there again. Lord, please help me. Show me where I can go. Show me what I can do to turn my back on this and be free of it. See, our sincerity is proven in the way that we live, the help that we seek, the prayers that we offer, and the choices we make. Do you want to know if you're preparing for Christ's coming? I get this question sometimes. Uh, Pastor, how how do I know that I'm doing the right things and going about the right way and preparing and and, and making sure my life is the way it, it should be? Just answer this question. It's really straightforward. It's simple. Is my life bearing fruit? Is my life bearing fruit? That's why this fruits of the Spirit that we studied earlier this year and then part of last year was so important. Is my life bearing fruit? fruit. It's not about a test about whether or not be saved. That's not what it's talking about. The test for salvation is in Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. Everyone knows John 3, 16 says, for God loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The test for a heart that is active in their preparation to meet Jesus is a test of whether or not we are seeing fruit in our lives. Are we seeing fruit in our lives? And there's a lot of varieties of fruit. Increased service. A closer relationship with God. A greater ability to encourage and to care for others. A strong family life. Victory over sin. Greater peace deeper love. Think of your life maybe three or four years ago, three or four Christmases ago. Do you have more fruit in your life today than what you did back then? 
If you do, then good, keep going, keep preparing. You're, you're, you're being effective in your preparation. But if you look back at your life three or four years ago and you say, you really know, I, I don't. It's not too late to start bearing fruit now. Maybe there's some repentance that you need to do. Maybe it's repentance of complacency. Man, that's a big one, isn't it? Just saying, well, whatever. Just complacency. A lot of people in this season of, of 2020 have just grown complacent about worshiping God, about gathering with other believers. We're seeing the effects of that. Complacency needs to be repented of. Religion needs to be repented of. We're not a religion. We're about a relationship. And too many times we go through the rituals without even thinking about the relationship, and this is no good. There's a lot of things that can hold us back in our spiritual lives that need to be repented of. Draw near to God in expectancy. Look for ways to fruitfully live out your life. Here's the thing. Christmas is coming. The second advent is coming. And in our expectation, let's get prepared. Not necessarily prepared to open presents and eat the meals and all that sort of stuff. Prepare our hearts for the Messiah. The promise that Malachi and all the other prophets clung to was that they would be rescued. And so it's important that we remember our preparation is not our salvation and it's not our rescue. Rather, our preparation, and I want you to hear this, our preparation is the response for what Jesus has already done. Be impacted this Christmas season. Realize this. Christmas was a rescue mission. Christmas was a rescue mission. The one who came to our rescue, he wasn't outgunned or outclassed or some hopeless underdog. The one who came to our rescue was Emmanuel, God with us. The power and the authority of heaven to call down angels to fulfill his purpose and desires. This ancient one humbled himself to become fully man because we were hostages being held captive by sin. Christmas was the beginning of a rescue mission that was conceived and carried out by none other than God himself. Emmanuel, God with us, has come. We have been rescued. And through his rescue, we are offered salvation and eternal life. The opportunity to have our sins forgiven and to be made right with God. You see, there was nothing that we could do to make us right with God. We needed to be rescued. And so the good news is that God loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus into the world. Jesus, who is God, took on flesh and became the perfect sacrifice for sin. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus died for the forgiveness of sin. And on the third day, Jesus raised from the dead, proving that everything he claimed was true. And so this morning, even today, when you call on the name of Jesus, he hears your prayer. He forgives you of your sin and he makes you clean. The question I have for you this morning is, are you prepared? Are you prepared for a second coming? Have you repented of your sin? Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Will you call on his name this morning and, and receive the forgiveness that he offers? He wants to be your Emmanuel, your God with us. The question is, will you let him into your life to save you? Please bow your heads and, and close your eyes. If you're here this morning and you've never asked, never accepted Jesus as the forgiveness of your sins, you've never repented, you're, you're living the way you want to live. You haven't given much thought maybe to it, but today, you know what you need to do. You need to repent of your sin and turn to Christ. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me for my sins. Make me clean. I ask Jesus to be my Savior and the Lord of my life, first in every way. 
My life is not my own. I give it to you. Thank you for new life. It's in Jesus' name I pray. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, repenting of your sins, accepting Jesus as your Savior, would you raise your hand? Is there anyone here this morning prayed to receive Christ? If you're online and you prayed to receive Christ, there's a number that you can text on the screen. Text that number. Let us know of your decision so that we can pray with you, so that we can guide you and what it means to follow Christ. Is there anyone here this morning present prayed to receive Christ? Father God, we thank you for sending Jesus to rescue us from our sins, to redeem us. In the response and in preparation for our home in heaven, we pray the prayer of David in Psalm 139. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Use this time of response here at the end of this worship service to spend some time talking with God about what's going on in your life. Use this time. Don't waste these moments with God. Examine your heart. Examine your life. Is there something that you need to repent of? Is there something that, that you've not thought of and, and it's coming to mind right now? Use this time. Don't waste these moments with God. Normally we stand for the time of response, but I've kind of liked the stillness of sitting and, and the stillness of saying, this is time for us to reflect. Maybe even kneel before God. There's, there's space between the rows now. You can, you can use that. But the point is, use this time to respond as the Holy Spirit is leading you as the praise team sings.